Hello, film fans. Welcome to the Film vs. Film podcast. My name is Martin Harries, your host. I'm a filmmaker on occasion, but mainly can't stop yapping about movies. On this podcast, every episode, I pick a topic from a film that's coming out at the cinema or on streaming. I pick a favorite film from that topic and battle it out against a guest to decide which film will become the greatest film of all time. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave us a five star review and subscribe. Please enjoy part one. Hello, Podaroonies or Podsters, if you prefer. This episode as Bob Marley, One Love, and you may have noticed I did not do the accent. <laughs> Pat on the back for me. <laughs> so we are talking biopics, naturally, and of course I have returning guests for the third time. Sam and Callum from the One of Us is Bored podcast. And I think I've worked out why you're called that now. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah it's great to have you guys on how are you guys not bad not bad thanks for having us back good good yeah hanging in there yeah all good like a bad smell good, good. <laughs> Once get rid of yeah. us. <laughs> can't get rid of us <laughs> so uh tell us about your podcast and where can we find you yes so we uh where you where you can find us first uh we're available on all the regular streaming platforms spotify uh, apple Podcasts, amazon audible all of that good stuff. Uh, you can also find us on Instagram at one of us is bored. We take a theme every month and we will watch a number of f- uh, films that fit in with that theme. And then we just sort of pick our favorites based on that. So recent themes have included Dylan November, where we were looking at the films uh, starring Dylan Gosh. O'Brien at uh, August <laughs> last year, which was a uh, twilight August, you know, very high class stuff. We keep it classy. <laughs> one of us is bored. We just talk about the things we like, things we don't like, and yeah, I think I think one of the appeals for us is that like we're we're not shy about sharing our opinions, and we don't sit there and agree with each other all the time. If we if we seriously disagree, we'll <laughs> about it. So we will squabble. <laughs> Many arguments. <laughs> we will squabble. <laughs> that's our new tagline. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah no so that's us so yeah come and come and join us for a good time sometime. Yeah. Yeah. One of us is bored. The Scottish squ- squabblers. <laughs> uh, one love is out uh now another musical biopic uh what do we make of this one then it looks kind of interesting kingsley benadir is in the lead role he seems to be on a bit of a role at the moment he was in that marvel tv show and a few other things what do we make of it <laughs> Callum steering into the boy <laughs> <laughs> oh sorry i was letting you go first no, sorry. i can go i can go if you want I, I mean, I would have reasonably high expectations of it. I think a lot of the musical biopics we've seen in the last, I was going to say in the last few years, as if like Rocket Man wasn't like a good three or four years ago. Pandemic time doesn't count. <laughs> Pandemic time almost doesn't count. But that and Bohemian Rhapsody, I, I think we've had quite the yeah. Elvis one as well. Mm. Uh, uh, I think we've had quite a good number of high quality biopics in recent years. And I think it would be, It'd be a real shame in some ways if this was the first to sort of like buck that trend and, and fall off a bit. Um, I must say, having said that, while I'm sure it'll be really, really good, I'm not the biggest reggae fan ever. No, um, I, I, there's a few Bob Marley songs which I like, but he's never one of these people that I would go out of my way to to listen to. So it's it falls into a weird patch for me and I'm sure it'll be a great film, but the subject matter itself probably isn't necessarily my cup mm. of tea but I'm sure it'll be really good. Yeah, certainly throughout history, he was a controversial figure at the time. There wasn't a uh, assassination attempt on his life. That's what I've read, and it's, it's shown in the trailer as well, so I guess it, it it should make a really interesting movie. Yeah, I mean, musical biopic's really popular. you got the Whitney Houston one recently, the Aretha Franklin mm. one as well. Amy Winehouse one coming up. Yeah, that one's coming, yeah. We could literally do a, an episode on like just musical biopics. There's kind of a lot of them now. I still think Rocket Man is my favorite. <laughs> we should have chosen Rocket Man, yeah. Callum. <laughs> <laughs> that was so close to being our choice, but my thing was like it was too obvious a choice. But also, it's like the problem with them is they're so loose. Like Rocket Man's so artistic, we'll say creative yeah. with the story. So I can't really determine how that would be seen as a biopic. Right. Yeah, I see it as more I mean. of a musical. Yeah, me. we did it 
on uh, our musicals episode, Rocket Man versus the Greatest Showman. And of course, okay, so it's good we didn't do it then. <laughs> <laughs> Rocket Man wipes the floor with uh, the Greatest Showman. Love the music in that one. That's interesting. It's an okay film, but you know the music is pretty good. <laughs> the Greatest Showman was the the film when I worked in the cinema. Right. That film stayed there for a year. Like it would never leave. Like it started off really slow, wouldn't bloody leave. <laughs> so I have like Vietnam War flashbacks thinking yeah. about that film. <laughs> so we're talking biopics, then, guys. Um, let's go with your choice first. Then, what did you go for? We went for Tick Tick Boom because we when when I read that I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest. See, when I read the list, I assumed it had to be a musical biopic. So I was like, is either Rocket Man or this one? <laughs> and then you come up with your choice. I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Okay. I see. <laughs> cool. Were there any other um, films in contention for you? Was it just this one in Rocket Man or any others? Did you have thoughts, Cal? I didn't really give Cal a chance to have a thought. I was just like, we're doing this. All right. Didn't have a choice in the matter. <laughs> no, I, I think my, my first reaction was something like Rocket Man, but then I was also really, really open to the idea of doing something possibly a little bit less well right. known. I don't know how fair that is to say. Like, I. I I mean, I'm I'm just gonna let the cat out of the bag. I wasn't hugely familiar with Tick Tick Boom until Sam mentioned it about a week ago. Like, it's I don't think it's one that necessarily. I mean, for me, it flew under the radar a bit. So it was an opportunity to look at something a little bit unusual and different. And yeah, this might be this might be the first that some people are hearing about it as well, potentially. <laughs> Possibly. So sorry that you're hearing about it via us, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a shame. No, no, it's a great pick. Yeah, it was a bit like that for me. I, I I knew it came out. I was aware of it. I didn't go and see it when it came out. But it's an interesting story about Jonathan Larson. I think it was just Netflix, though. I don't right. think it came out anywhere, to be fair. Oh, okay. Did you see it on Netflix when it came out then, Sam? No? No. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's funny because so Tick Tick Boom's a musical I knew about be- way before it was a film. Right. Because every... I don't know if I'm getting into this early, too early, but I feel like every teenage girl goes through their rent phase okay. where they love it, and then they do, then they grow up a bit and they're like, "Wait a minute, this is a bit shit," but the music's good. You okay. Know what I mean? And then you circle around to tick tick boom, and the same thing happens. But then you end up, you know, you're almost hit thirty, and you're like, "Oh, it makes sense now." Yeah. I understand the panic because <laughs> you know we're not we're nowhere near thirty, are we, Callum? No, definitely not. It's very young, very young. Yeah, and I'm clearly yeah. still under twenty. Uh, so <laughs> under twenty, <laughs> same. Yeah. Same. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens in Tick Tick Boom? So Tick Tick Boom is uh, based on an autobiographical musical of the same name, and it follows the journey of an aspiring composer, Jonathan Larson, as he navigates the challenges of pursuing his Broadway dreams in the 1990s New York City. There you go. Nice. I planned ahead because I'm not letting what happened to Callum happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> still haven't forgot yeah. about that. Almost a year ago and it still haunts me. So <laughs> Still very entertaining to listen back to. <laughs> yeah. But yeah it's, it's a weird one because it is based on a musical where he wasn't actually, you know, he would go around doing it by himself, mm. but it became like a proper musical after he died. And it was a three a three person musical. But didn't actually have any of the stuff about him in it. So Lynn Manuel Miranda kind of did a mixture of a biopic and actually shoot, doing an adaptation yeah. of a musical. So it's an odd one, which is why we chose it. Cool. So Callum, initial reactions to this one? What did you make of it? I, as I say, I wasn't really a hundred percent sure what to expect going into this. It it won me round more the further I got yeah. into it. I think. Part of the problem I had watching this is a lot of the characters reminded me of um, people that I knew or have known <laughs> right. in real life. Okay. So not that it really matters for the context of this, but I, I used to do uh, stage work, um, light and sound technician work for um, okay. shows and yeah. things like that. And I would you would have to work with a lot of these lovies who are all about the art and, oh, I'm too important to like carry this on stage. I'll need someone else to bring that on for me. And a lot of right. these kind of aspiring writers filmmakers stage play production one of these they kind of have that same energy and it was mildly like (laughs) mildly sore for me to watch a little bit um but when i got over that there's a lot here i think you've you've obviously got the the uh the main sort of underlying story of 
Larson. Larson, Larson, that's mm-hmm. his name. You got Larson, uh, Larson's story here going on as well. But then you've also got the, I guess, the, the commentary on like the AIDS, the AIDS epidemic, and you've got all these other little things going on as well. It's a really, in many ways, it's a it's a very beautifully written and beautifully told film. But I struggled to get really into it until probably uh the last third or so and then i was sold by the time i was into the final sort of 40 minutes um but i did have to stick with it a bit how about you sam you were um i think more enthusiastic (laughs) yeah well it's because i kind of had that as i said before that that growth with it like so have you guys seen rent i've not (laughs) no (laughs) like so it's about these these artsy people uh who live in uh in in the slums (laughs) essentially and they're all like there's a filmmaker, there's like a, a dancer, and and basically they all have they all have AIDS. Um, it's parodied in Team America. That's the one that's that's parodied if you've seen Team America. Right. But the the problem I had, so I loved it as a kid. I was like, yeah, arts, everything. Did it. The problem you have is during the the actual musical, they have their parents phoning them. So they're all rich kids who have chosen to be poor for art, but then they complain about being mm. poor, but then they ignore their parents. And I found that, like, I was like, oh, you're not actually struggling. You're choosing to struggle. And I kind of saw that same thing in Tick, Tick, Boom to a degree because yeah. he does have his, like, his parents took him to the opera. Like, have you been to an opera? Like, that's such a niche rich person <laughs> thing. Yeah. Um, hmm. But I, l- I actually really liked that they showed, you know, all of it because the, the reality is the people who make our art are, lots of them are people like this, like pretentious mm-hmm. weirdos. <laughs> so I yeah. really enjoyed um, seeing all the worst parts that people will say, you know, the, yeah, he did this great show and he's really good at writing music, but he did struggle to do it because he was pretentious and precious with his stuff. Yeah. I think there's, I think there's a really good point there actually. in that like a lot of the time, some of the best art comes from struggle or some kind of experience. It's very difficult mm. to create something about something when you know, you know, you haven't lived it yeah. necessarily. Yeah. And so I think the the almost the struggling by choice, the poor by choice, I'm going to live in New York City of all places, like one of the most expensive places yeah. on the planet to live. Uh, and I'm going to be a waiter while also chasing my dreams of writing musical or whatever. Like it's very, it is very whimsical and obviously people do it. Mm-hmm. Like it's not, it, like no. it's not completely unheard of for people to do it but it is it is a self-inflicted kind of struggle as opposed to someone that's born into yeah, it's like, very much a choice that makes yeah. the turning point of when he changes in that last third resort to enjoy it when he discovers his friend has hiv i weirdly mm-hmm. his friend is still alive jonathan larson's not his friend is fits a fiddle um <laughs> but that turning point <laughs> yeah. so rent is about people who are suffering with hiv and aids and obviously they didn't choose that but that's why it's such a mm-hmm. better piece of art than say for example superbia where he's just writing about society at large but he hasn't actually suffered any of society at large he's you know well he's, mm. he thinks he has but you know yeah. he's not dying of a of an illness like that during a <laughs> crisis so yeah. it, it does get better when he realizes that when you have that turning point of i think it's called is this real life that that song from that point mm. onwards he's more mm, likable because yeah. he's like he's like okay the struggle's not real <laughs> the struggle is my own but <laughs> i can make good stuff out of this struggle it's like you properly struggle so you're right callum yeah, yeah. <laughs> actual struggle makes good art yeah, I really enjoyed it. I didn't think it was like amazing. I thought it was good. I was a bit like you, Callum. I struggled a little bit with the first like quarter, halfway through the film. And then like towards the end, it, it was great. You know, it really got me. Um, and Andrew Garfield is quite an extraordinary actor. He goes through all the emotions in this. <laughs> At times, I feel like he's going at like 100 miles an hour and it's a bit overwhelming. You're like, oh, my God. I mean, that might be a reflection of Jonathan Larson anyway, of how his um, personality was like. Um, But, yeah, I I enjoyed it a lot. And, you know, I'm a big Hamilton fan. I've seen it twice on stage in London, twice (laughs) on on uh, Disney Plus, cried every time. Mm -hmm. Um, This film didn't make me cry. Um, but you know, I did feel the feels at times. Yeah, so I I, I enjoyed it. See, it's weird because I went through that same arc um, with Hamilton because I feel like everyone turned on Lin Lin Manuel Miranda really quickly all of a sudden during the pandemic. Yeah, and I kind of fell for that a bit. But I'm back on the train now. I'm, I'm like, yeah, why why do we? It's like how everyone started hating Anne Hathaway for no reason. So directing then. I really like the opening number, like the happy birthday song, like Lin-Manuel Miranda, like starts off the number on stage, like it's kind of stays there for what feels like a while. Then 
I'm like, okay, Andrew Garfield can hold this number well in this one place quite well. Then we cut to, then we cut to this cafe uh, that he works at. Uh, and I was kind of quite relieved because I was like, okay, are we still going to be on stage this whole time? But then we cut away, you know, this is a film. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, see if it was yeah. an adaptation of the stage play, that would have been it. Because it's literally yeah. just him monologuing. <laughs> it's very self-indulgent as a play. Like, I will say that, like, Tick, Tick, Boom is super self-indulgent. Yeah. What's interesting, though, is that we go into dialogue and there's no, like, singing anymore for a moment. But the pace of the dialogue is really quick and snappy, plus the music is still going. So it feels like the cafe scene is still part of the number. It does it again with a scene in in a library. Then we go into more of a traditional, like, montage-type scene to end the number. And I feel like um, Lin-Manuel Miranda has immediate, immediately like adapted his freestyle uh, songwriting to directing a, a movie really well in this like first number, combining these scenes with music and dialogue. So, you know, I really enjoyed the first number here. Yeah, I love the first number. Just, just on the on the point of combining the music and the 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 dialogue as well. They do that during the scene um where Larson's having a fight with his, I guess, soon to be ex. Yeah, <laughs> yeah therapy. The, yeah, the therapy. Therapy. Uh, there almost there's a lot of talking over each other in addition to the music that's going on as well. I think it's a recurring feature throughout this, and I just think I didn't. It, it's funny because I never really noticed it until I started noticing it, and then I just thought the way that this is constructed and the, the decisions that have been made here, they do really work. But I do think you kind of have to be. At the same time, I think you kind of have to be in the right kind of headspace for it. Mm. I think if you're approaching it in the sense of, oh, I can't be bothered with a, a, a musical thing today where everyone's just singing their feelings <laughs> or talking their feelings or whatever, I don't know that you would necessarily be that engrossed by it, but it worked for me, I have to say. I mean, yeah, to be fair, if you're if you're going to watch Tick, Tick, Boom, it is, it is a musical. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. It's a full-blown musical, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a weird choice nowadays that they're trying to not advertise things as musicals. Like, have you seen that with the Mean Girls one? Like, they tried to oh, advertise yeah. it like it wasn't, but it was like, this is literally a Broadway show adaptation. Like, So yeah, that's how that happens. People go in, they're like, the hell is this? <laughs> Why are they singing? Yeah, they've done that again with um uh, The Colour Purple recently that's just come out, I think. Um, that's an adaptation of the musical, not a, like a remake of the film. Yeah. Mm. The second number during the party is great, but I just felt you have this party scene going on uh, in John's apartment, and then we stop. A lot of the, like the background noise and the music just cuts out. Then lots of clapping and backslapping happens, and then we go into the song. I just felt like that it wasn't particularly very fluid going into the musical number. Like a bit stop start for me, but. But saying that, it was probably my favourite song. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, well, yeah. that's a bad thing for me to... Because that was originally where 3090 was. So originally the show okay. was called Boho Days. And that was oh, nice. the opening number. So I think they just put it... It wasn't really necessary to the plot, to say. But then I guess lots right. of the songs aren't. It's more just like a ramble the whole thing's just a ramble from his perspective yeah. so i guess it does set the scene a bit but sorry i was just gonna say part of it's allowing you to get uh a sort of an understanding of the relationships between the characters as well so seeing them in that house party environment you know there's some people who are there just because mm -hmm. oh you know art students or whatever arty people throw the best parties and then there's some people who are actually legitimately yeah. friends or whatever and i think allowing them all to participate in that environment see their reactions to spontaneous singing or mm. whatever creativity um i think that's kind of part of it it's probably that's probably more important than whatever the song itself is in some ways i would say potentially yeah i really enjoyed the song I, i'm not saying anything against the song at all it's just you have like no no your standard um dialogue scene you know a great scene um but then it, i i just felt the scene stops for a few seconds and then we go into the song it just didn't feel particularly fluid to me and it just showed a little bit of Lima Mel or Marella, Miranda's uh inexperience you know in filmmaking a little bit there but in, a, in a way that's kind of charming because okay <laughs> no I don't know I don't know like, for me I would rather he stick to making musicals and if that doesn't hit with film fans that's okay. You know what I okay. mean? Cause it's not really for film fans. I know it as a film, but you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? It is definitely, it's like very self-indulgent again towards the, yeah. the Broadway stuff. Like it's all in jokes for people who like musicals and I like them, but not as much as they do. Um, I like, yeah. like them casual. 
I, I think there's something to that actually, because to some extent, if you're not a fan of, I guess, Larson's previous work or aren't really aware of his impact within mm. theatre, within musicals or whatever, there's not necessarily, I mean, you might stumble upon this, but it would be a weird film to just kind of dive yeah. into. Whereas like we mentioned the, the the Bob Marley film earlier, you don't necessarily need to be a fan to dive into that. I, f- I feel like there's more cultural knowledge there of like a Bob Marley than there is of a, yeah of a Jonathan Larson. And maybe that speaks to my ignorance towards stage, but I, I just feel like one of them's a bigger star and therefore a, a bigger draw for a non musically inclined yeah. audience, if that makes sense. Yeah. So there's kind of the room to experiment in the way that mm-hmm. there isn't with the Bob Marley film, but, but, it yeah. might not hit for some people, which is fair. Like I didn't, I didn't. I'm going to be honest. For me, the Boho Days song is a skip because I listen to the soundtrack. And when right. you're when you're doing a jog, thirty ninety hits a lot better than Boho Days. <laughs> like, <you know. laughs> uh, the presentation scene where John finally shows off is like new song that the film has has had. John struggle to write the whole film it is really mm. great like i really like the way miranda cuts to carissa in the room and, and john imagining susan singing the song on the roof like when they had an, an intimate moment um earlier in the film that worked quite well but as the song goes along susan is mainly singing and i thought it was going to carry on with her but the scene cuts back and forth to carissa again so it becomes like a duet essentially and for me i wasn't sure that that was the right way to go because for me all the emotions should be coming from susan right you know plus uh, vanessa hudgens who plays carissa has a better voice for me so i was like can we just stay with carissa please <laughs> she's better <laughs> did you have that same feeling or I, like there was a song called green dress that was originally in the show uh, sorry in the okay film. it's in the it's in the show it's not cut from the show it was in the film and that, I, like it's such a shame they got rid of that because I feel like I quite liked I don't is it called Alexandria her name the girl who played Susan Alexandra yeah yeah mm-hmm. like I thought her voice was really nice it was more realistic I think Vanessa Hudgens for okay. me has such a show voice like I can't picture right, her just yeah. singing doing the dishes like she's a show voice person <laughs> that's so funny you say that because for me vanessa hudgens is she did she did the song that sampled baby come back like yeah. she that's her that's vanessa hudgens is like 2000s like yeah. r&b wannabe for me so i don't i don't anticipate i don't relate her to the show at all i was high school musical with her right <laughs> yeah to, yeah to, to be fair yeah i i mean i i must say so the the writing or the the production of come to your senses which is yeah. the song we're talking about here I think I agree. I I liked it when it was the one voice, and then suddenly mm. we were swapping between the two. Now, from a from a from a film perspective, from a storytelling perspective, I quite liked it because it's mm. showing without telling. Um, essentially, like we don't need him to say, "Oh, I'm seeing my ex here." When I'm when the performer's on stage, that's fine. It's it's showing us instead of telling. Great. From a from a song point of view, I don't know that it necessarily. I would agree. I think I would have preferred mm. it with one voice, but I think it's what what do you want here? Do you want a do you want a well produced song or do you want a a competent sort of effective part of the film? And I think because this is a film, we need to lean towards the film bit. So on that basis alone, I I did like the transition. I would say that presentation sequence yeah. I really like as a whole. I think when we're when we're waiting to see whether or not. Um, anyone's going to turn up and then it turns out he's he's been there an hour earlier than he needs to be so it's not it's not yeah. a big stress that it's meant to, it's, uh, that he's made it out to be the high profile figures that he's reserved seats for one of them sneaking in at the end the the nervous looks around between him and his friends and even the lead up to that when he's been pushing people away you know his, his friends said to him i've got something i need some advice from you on i can't talk to you right now i'm, I'm busy writing a song and obviously it turns out to be a life-changing thing that he's missed out on he did people did try to reach out to him and tell him things and he's just been pushing people away this was the turning point in the film for me this whole presentation sequence is when everything after that i was like right you know what i'm invested now he's a lot more likable isn't he when he's stressed out and in the real world (laughs) yeah yeah definitely yeah so for me in that scene i maybe just would have preferred if we just stayed like on the rooftop with um susan 
But then again, you're like, you kind of still need to be, you want to still feel the presence in that room during that presentation yeah. scene. So I, I understand why Miranda went that way in basically making the song a duet. So we were in both like in the room and kind of in Jonathan Larson's head as well. But I feel like like emotionally it's a little bit lost. You get a little bit lost splitting the scene up in into two locations. No, I'd agree. I'd agree to an extent. Uh favorite shot or scene, Sam? What are you going for? God, I don't know. I don't know. I like lots of the swimming pool <laughs> stuff. The swimming pool sequence. I can't even remember what the song's called, okay. to be honest. But with a little musical notes appear in a pool, it just looks cool. Because a film that's very rooted in like yeah artistry and kind of reality of new york but it's nice to have some like cool fantastical bits even actually you know the the broadway cameo bit mm. where they're in the diner and the the the, the wall falls yeah. and then you have all these cameos from like so you have we were saying this in the break calm <laughs> they have philip is uh-huh. and, and renee from like the original castle of hamilton but then you have a bunch of people who i couldn't name because i'm not really that into musicals in the same way that I thought it was clearly but they also have three of the original cast members of Rent <laughs> in there as well and they have oh, I can't and cool. they have Michaela Diamond as well who played the young Cher in the Cher show so lots of cool people in there so it's nice to just have yeah. a little nod because it's just showing you who the audience is like Miranda's aware of who who's going to watch this realistically and enjoy it it's for musical yeah. people <laughs> and that's yeah. fine but yeah, yeah it's nice yeah during that song I was like I know he's showing me a famous person right now but I don't know who it is <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's like me and The Simpsons. They yeah. mentioned they name drop people all the time in The Simpsons. I'm like, who? Because it's just so American. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the f- my favorite number was with his friend, like Michael, where they go to his new, like, fancy apartment and the song goes from their old apartment to the new one. The scenes in his old one, like, Miranda takes out, like, a lot of the color a little bit, desaturates the, the screen. And and there's like some really fast cutting and sharp camera movements going on, which I found really fun. And it's probably the funniest uh, scenes too, where they're kind of like having a shower together <laughs> at one moment. That was fun, you know. Whereas like the directing in in the new big open plan apartment is very fluid, like like lots of long takes and has like a pristine quality to it, you know, with a few like background dancers, um, because of course. Uh, so I loved how like Miranda really embraced like the film medium here in this song, especially where you can't necessarily do that sequence in any other format. I would say in terms of um, in terms of my favorite scenes, I think that scene with the flat with the open plan apartment. I have to say the flat the, the flat that they're um, moving into there. <laughs> that's just everyone's dream flat for when you're thinking about moving to New York City, isn't it? You've got like the view of all the buildings around you. It's it's. It's floor to ceiling windows. You've got all the bright lights of everything there. It's just everyone's every oh God. It's just it's just the sort of flat that everyone would love to have. I know I would anyway. I think in terms of my favorite scenes and things, to be honest, I, I think the fight. I think during therapy was probably one of mine. It was the contrast of the the actual fight going on plus the kind of whimsical lyrics that are within the song the the slightly off the wall facial expressions that the actors are making on stage simultaneously i thought that contrast worked really well and i thought a lot of the decisions made during that were particularly good and then again at the risk of repeating myself to be honest it was really the overall the 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 presentation of the new song that kind of again really sold everything for me so that's probably my second choice for like favorite part of the whole film but yeah there we are do you know for Jonathan Larson's stands, it would be the Superbia musical at all being their favourite part? Because that musical is locked away, we'll never see the light of day. So the fact that Miranda mm. got access to any of it and got it in the film is a bloody miracle. Yeah. Like that will never see the light of day. Uh so directing school for me, I'm yeah, I really liked it. Um I think you can see a little bit of the inexperience from Lin Manuel Miranda as his debut film, but as a first film, I still think it's pretty impressive. Pretty impressive, yeah. Yeah, so I'll go like a a seven point six for me. I forgot about your points. <laughs> <laughs> One of us is bored. What's your score for directing then? For tick tick boom. All right, what's your thoughts, Callum? I mean, I did. I didn't think it was bad at all. There are def- there are definitely some choices that, in another context, would seem slightly weird and a little bit off the wall, but. There was nothing in there that made me feel particularly aggrieved in any way. 
I don't know. I would I would probably right. lean for like a for a seven or so. I think we should do an eight, Callum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you reckon to go for an eight? I think we should do an eight because it's his first one, right? Okay, we'll go over an eight. <laughs> and it's bloody good. Yeah. That's a big a big undertaking yeah. to do, and it is an adaptation of a musical where the musical is just him sat there on the stage. That's impressive. They actually made a story happen at all. Yeah. Uh, screenplay then so the framing device of john on stage telling the story is just really efficient for me and it's used in lots of different ways where john is just on stage like providing some like extra context and voiceover and when he's performing on stage he sometimes just highlights a song or like a little scene where he's playing on the piano and most of the time his performance is completely like intercut with a number most of the time it works um really well but when like susan comes up to his apartment waiting for an answer about if he's gonna like go with her because she's got like a great new job etc and it's about to be like a great meaty argument scene and then we go again into like a musical number on stage and it's done in quite a slapsticky comedy way and it's kind of intercut with john and susan trying to like have an argument and I feel like the emotions are trying to come through, uh, but it's completely undercut by like the comedy. You know, that's not that funny anyway. <laughs> so I just felt like, do we really need a musical number here? Especially when like John and Susan are not singing in this scene uh, in the apartment. So I felt a little frustrated with that one in particular. I can feel your disagreement coming. <laughs> yeah, I, I would argue that the contrast is, right. is the point. Yeah in many ways um so she she um she accuses him of using parts of their relationship and interpreting them into his art and because all he can think about is well how you know this musical that i've been writing for the last eight years the way he perceives it and yeah. and it is his perception because as we learn throughout the film his his understanding of not only his relationships but his reality as it were uh, not everyone around him agrees and whether that manifests in the form of him not necessarily ap appreciating that his friends are having a hard time him turning down offers of like i guess quote unquote real work that people are offering him the reminders that you know your girlfriend's about to move away and she's asking you to go with her and this is a real like this is a real turning point like do you go right do you go left like this is a real fork in the road here all of these things at the end of the day, mm. come down to his perception. And obviously, I mean, as it would be, it's his story. Of course, it's going to be through his through his eyes. But to some extent, I wonder if he do, it kind of shows that like, he appreciates the fights a big deal, but he maybe doesn't necessarily appreciate it as the big deal that it is, at least not at the time. I don't know. What do you think, Sam? What, do you have any? See, I, know, I, I agree that that was the way to do it because Tech Tech Boom is... That's a unique part of this, of this movie is that yeah. Tech Tech Boom, the musical is his perspective of what was happening but like his perspective is definitely not reality and so Lynn manuel mm. interviewed a bunch of his friends including janet who is susan essentially to get her right. perspective so it's a kind of a good way of meshing john's perspective how he views the things but with reality as well could just had the stage show like you know it'd be a comical piss take you know of, of an argument so can it kind of reads mm. it back into reality and is a good contrast of how he sees the world is just this overblown kind of show show tune i just feel like for me like the argument like wasn't emotional enough and like when we cut to like the onstage stuff with the comedy it's, it's not funny enough so like they're kind of each scene is like diluting each other if you know what i mean so i understand what they're going for. But i don't think it's meant to be funny it's meant to be more sarcastic i guess and you have to keep in mind yeah. that people watching the show i guess if you watch like boom you don't see the reality so that what we see is the his reality when we're watching just the musical so just ignore the film part like pretend you don't see the film part so just imagine right. it's all <laughs> you know what i mean it's yeah. definitely it's not meant to be like laugh out loud it's definitely meant to be a bit tragic as well because there's definitely some problems mm. being shown you know underneath there like it's quite it's quite dark really but I also think the problem is with yeah. doing adapting a musical to do a biography is you can't really ditch therapy because it's the big, one of the biggest songs in the show. You know what I mean? Mm. So if they just cut that because they're like, oh, that's not going to be an effective way to be in a film, then you're not adapting Tick, Tick, Boom. You're just doing a lackluster Jonathan Larson documentary because there's already one. There's, there's right. one called no, no Day But Today and it's a real documentary rather than like an active okay. one. So it's like, well, if you're not going to have 
the songs in it. Why do it? That's what I'd say about a, a bio doc. Why would you make this if you're not going to include yeah. something different in it? So if you just did a realistic fight scene, and I'm assuming that therapy is not just about that one fight. It will be like a buildup of them because obviously she's wanting him to say, stay here. But he doesn't understand that. He sees it as something totally different. He thinks it's just that she disagrees with his art. So yeah. it's not just based off that one fight, even though the film's only showing right. you that one fight. Yeah, so I guess for me, like maybe like the balance wasn't quite there or they could have done it slightly differently for me. But yeah, I totally understand what you're saying there, Sam. What I loved about the film, though, is that it, the portrayal of how like brutal the creative industry is, <laughs> and that John has to sacrifice like so much for his musical. Like he has a difficult relationship with his girlfriend because she's got like a job out of town. He has a troubled l- relationship with his friend Michael and struggles obviously when he finds out that Michael is HIV positive. John has all that to deal with and then he gets so close to like a green light for his new show and then it all falls apart and just has to start again from scratch you know that is brutal um the Mm. fact that we follow him for so long and he doesn't get it he doesn't get his musical on stage but what i liked especially is that his friends recognize that john is a genius and that he would be wasted talent if he like sold out for like a comfortable job like michael and susan but they all recognize that you know they're in their own way which i really appreciate they don't necessarily see themselves as geniuses whereas john clearly is one in a musical sense so i kind of liked how that comes through in the movie it's it's a really interesting point in some ways because putting yourself in that kind of situation you're torn between thinking your friend is particularly talented and should pursue something but also thinking you know realistically there is a point at which I suppose you do have to like again quote unquote get a real job and and the funny the funny thing is this film ties into a lot of my own personal anxieties about aging and things as well right. and f- I felt like a bit personally attacked at the start the song about turning 30 I was a bit like oh <laughs> <laughs> this this feels like this this is too close to home in there um, <laughs> yeah same but it, it felt like that, that there is an element of that a lot of people will sit there and say Oh, you know, age doesn't matter. You know, the offer of the the was it the offer of the Lord of the Rings didn't write those until he was forty five or something like that. You know, yeah. all of this, all of this stuff's irrelevant. Doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, but those are outliers. You know, like if you're if you're wanting to get into stage work, if you're wanting to be a performer, if you're wanting to be anything, a lot of these things are, for better or worse, to a huge extent, youth oriented. Yeah. Um, and you know, there is a point at which it's just too late for you. And you do need to have some kind of backup plan. And I think uh, this film does a great, it does a great job at kind of highlighting that side of things. Although obviously, despite the fact he dies, it kind of works out for him like he like he's dead, but his show has gone on to be a, a, you know, a big success or, or whatever. I think one of my favorite parts about this was the conversation with the agent where he says, well, what do I do yeah. now? And she's like, well, you write, you write again, mm-hmm. you keep writing and hope something sticks to the wall. Because I think when people think about the creative industries, I don't think people realize the amount of rejection that goes into a lot of these things. It's not a case of you just, you do something one time and, and that's it. That's that's why people are famous. They'll have had rejection after rejection after rejection for the most part that we don't get to see. And you do just have to keep at it and keep at it. And it is pretty thankless. And not only that, even if you do like make it, for some people making it is still like low paid work or, or, you know, if they're even paid at all, like it's, it'll be runner work Mm. behind the scenes or it'll be maybe contributing an idea here or there. It doesn't necessarily actually translate into your name in lights at the end of the day. And I think, you know, that's obviously the reality for the vast majority. I mean, we've all known people who are incredibly talented and you think, oh, you should have been doing X and it just never happened for whatever reason. Like, And sometimes it just doesn't. And likewise, there are apparently people who do get lucky and uh, mm. have uh, things work out for them when they maybe shouldn't have as well. That's just the reality <laughs> of how these things are. So, you know. See, I kind of agree, kind of don't. Like, I do think it's a really good oh. reflection of like turning 30. Well, well, you know, being on the cusp, it's horrible. <laughs> like, um, no, she's like this <laughs> dread. It, I think that's the thing with any milestone, though. Like, you just feel like, should I have done this by this point? Da, 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 da. But then I saw like a guy wrote on, on Quora and he's 60. He's like, your clock is your own. And that's my new thing. It's like, there's a clock, <laughs> but it is your own clock. You know, when you should hit things um, and do certain things. Is it just a big societal pressure you have to get over? 
But I think mm. the thing is with like the arts and opportunities, it's not so much a youth oriented thing. It is a backup. Can someone catch you when you fail? And that is youth oriented inherently because it's like, how long can your parents support you? Or can you know your mm-hmm. flatmates support you? Or are they willing to even? Exactly. Yeah. At, 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 at some point, you're going to hit like maybe like 35, say, for example. Your, your parents aren't going to want to fund your dreams when you're 35. You know I mean, they might be willing to indulge you when you're like a writer in your early 20s because it's like, oh, he's just, you know, an adult. And then your friends all grow up and do other things and they're not going to want to fucking roommate with you and you've got barely any money. are not going to hang around with you, you've got barely any money. It's not so much an age thing. It's other people around you changing and everyone does. Like, so if you're wanting to continue in the arts, you really need to come from a rich background if you're not succeeding quickly or if you're not trying to mm-hmm. get a job on the side. Like, you can't just do what Jonathan Larson did now. Or if, if you're poor, no, you can't yeah. just write and wait because it's not like that's not going to work anymore because uh, cost of living and all that. Like, you, you physically cannot yeah. do both. But yeah. he's got this kind of bonus. It's never mentioned in this and that his parents did send him a lot of money while he was writing. Um, like they were definitely funding him. And the, the show, this kind of movie kind of says, oh, if you keep trying and trying and trying, eventually it's going to happen. Even if you do die as soon as you succeed, because he had a, obviously had an aortic dissection. Is that what it's called? On yeah. the day of the final Broadway preview Aneurysm. the final show preview and then he died on the it was meant to be the opening night so we didn't get to see anything happen but he's still in a privileged position where he had the time and the money to be able to do that like most people don't so it's not so I kind of agree with Calm. there is like a point where you have to say I need to get a proper job but it's not so much because of your age it's more because the support groups around you just slowly disappear and that's because of age. It's not, you know, I mean, it's related, but not the exact same thing. Um, so I love the reveal that he's been like performing Tick, Tick, Boom, like this whole time. And it was actually like, you know, a biographical musical, you know, in those bits where he is performing, you know, um, providing like the context of what's going on. So I find that was kind of cool. Um, and then when we see like real footage of the show during the credits, um, that was interesting. And you kind of can see how like where uh miranda has adapted the show for this movie and when you look back on the film you can see where like john larson maybe wanted the show to look for his own show uh for this film through miranda's eyes if that makes sense so i thought it was kind of interesting showing a lot of the real footage at the end so you kind of get a little bit of an idea of what john larson was actually going for when you look back on the movie did you get that yeah, it, well, it's it's weird because John Larson's version of the show was just him. Yeah, um, there would be no Vanessa Hudgens on the stage with him. Yeah, but it does work better as a three piece. I think the the people who then took that and, and made a different show. I think so. I kind of I respect that he used both versions. You know, I mean, he, he still had yeah. Jonathan singing the songs himself, but because um, I think Jonathan would set a, a piano for his versions, but on the three person version, it's just one guy. Oh, sorry, two guys and a girl, and they're moving around the stage, but they're not moving yeah. very far. <laughs> like they're moving as much as they can. So I like that he used both versions of Tick Tick Boom. I thought that was good. What about you, Cal? No, I think that's some. I think that's some good input. I like that you've got the background knowledge to know that <laughs> as well to sort of like yeah. bring that in. To be fair, because like I'd, I'd be hopeless without that. No, I think that's fair comment. To be fair. Uh, so favorite lines then who doesn't love show tunes with their French toast I thought was great Um, fresh flowers in the lobby an old white lady with a tiny dog this is real life uh, was a favorite of mine as well have you got any favorite lines guys (laughs) just for the gravity of it the um, okay what am I supposed to do now you start writing the next one and after you finish that one you start on the next and on and on and that's what it is to be a writer. You just keep throwing them against the wall and hoping that eventually something will stick. I love that. I'm going to steal it's, just, it's not funny, but it's just... <laughs> that's what's good to me. It's a great moment because with the agent, I think as you said before, Callum, like it's that kind of bombshell moment for John Larson that like, yeah, this is the industry. This is what you got to do. You might have to spend years of your life writing a musical and then, uh, you know, and it doesn't get made. <laughs> Uh, you just got to go through the process and it, it is a real gut punch um, when you watch it and when you mm. hear that. Sam, you got any favorite lines for you? I'm stealing Calm's. Calm's line sounds good to me. Sounds better than I would have wrote down. So, <laughs> our line is your line. Just on the subject of the agent, um, she also said, Rosa, Rosa Stevens, uh, she also says, <laughs> the first presentation of your musical is like having a colonoscopy in the middle of Times Square. 
only with a colonoscopy, the worst thing that could happen to you is that you find out you have cancer. With a musical, you find out you're already dead. Yep, that's so, my favorite line as well. <laughs> pretty brutal. My actual favorite line. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Brutal as fuck. So we're both still in counseling, is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He got there first. So screenplay score for me, uh, even though I didn't really know anything about this story at all, uh, about Tick, Tick, Boom, and about John Larson. You know, I thought it was really clever. And I just really love that kind of, like, fantastical element of the film and how it mixes that with reality. There's some really creative lines here. Um, and Well, obviously, really creative lyrics. Really enjoyed that. And I think when it touches on serious subject matter with the AIDS issues in the 80s and, you know, the relationships he has, I think it's really well done. So... And as we said, just that you go through this whole film and like you find out, yeah, he's not going to make it with this particular one is is quite like, oh, my God. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. So I'll go like an 8.6 for me. How about you guys? As someone who's like going through the struggle right now, the like, <laughs> other people have gone through. Yeah, I, I relate to it a lot. Like turning thirty is scary. I, I can't wait mm. till it's over with. I'm genuinely excited to be thirty, so that I don't have to worry about turning thirty anymore. It's done. Um, <laughs> because there's just a lot of pressure for no reason. I don't know what I'm meant to have done, but I feel like I'm meant to have done it. So, mm. and I haven't, or maybe I have. I don't know. I'll have to reflect when I'm forty and I'm having the same panic again. I think, Callum, we should take whatever your score is and add one to it. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> Oof, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was gonna, I was, I was thinking about eight to be fair. Yeah, okay. So, like, you'd have been, you'd have been, yeah. I think eight's reasonable for I it. I think, I think eight's good. It's, it's a good. I do, I do relate to a lot, but yeah, some of, some of the like artistry stuffs about reach for me. Like, you know, what I mean, some of the lines are a bit too. Like, I'm like, oh yeah, like the the bloody um, agent's really gonna be speaking in flowery language all the time. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I won't dare ask the question about the schools. <laughs> That you can use a certain thing. We well, don't um, do points here at the points. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Either it's solidly an eight or it's solidly a nine. It's not yep. in between. <laughs> yeah. Right. Acting then. I loved Andrew Garfield's scenes with Alexandra Ship, who plays his girlfriend Susan, because it's the scenes where like Andrew Garfield kind of slows down a little bit and mm -hmm. is a bit less frantic. But even then, you feel like he's still going at 100 miles an hour, but just with like the volume turned down, it's not a, a criticism. I just find it fascinating that like Andrew Garfield can go to these like different crazy levels of performance. Like, you know, he's a lot in this and it's quite overwhelming sometimes, but it, it's, yeah, he's amazing. Isn't it weird though that like in both musicals, Lynn Manuel Miranda's done, well, he's done more musicals, but like, yeah. In Hamilton and in Tick Tick Boom, both protagonists feel like they're running out of time. So it's like yeah. really frantic. But then ironically, both are running out of time because both died really young. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I guess maybe some people just know. Like he I don't know. His whole thing was like, oh my god, I'm I'm aging, I need to do this quick. And then maybe he stressed himself out into that happening. <laughs> um, but it did well actually I think it's because he had a genetic condition he didn't know about. But yeah, you know, I'll I'll just say that for my own narrative that he did a self-fulfilling <laughs> prophecy because it sounds cooler, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is really tragic. Like he finally, you know, in the credit sequence, like you find out he he did get success with um Rent. Oh, Rent's a, a huge musical, yeah. And then he dies, and it's just like, oh wow, that's that's a huge loss. Yeah, you don't get to see your own success that you've been working so hard towards. You know, he kept because lots of people give up. That's it. You you hit the age of thirty, and you're like, oh, that's it. I need to just yeah. do something else. But sometimes if you do persevere, and you have the backing behind you, it does it does work out. But then yeah. sometimes you have a genetic condition that's lurking behind you to kill you, and that's just also very unfortunate and ironic and tragic. I love the scene with Andrew Garfield when he's in this like advertising corporate brainstorming session yeah. <laughs> and all the other characters are like taking it very seriously and they think they're doing like a great job and I love like the cringy aspect that they give off like coming up with these terrible ideas whereas Andrew Garfield is like still quite energetic but he comes up with these ideas effortlessly <laughs> and like thrives yeah. off that even though very over like, he really doesn't want to be there <laughs> You know, as the scene ends, it's like he's dying inside a little bit. Like, why am I here? Then I love the way he just like takes the piss <laughs> at the end, coming up with Chubstitute. <laughs> That's a brilliant name, to be fair. Yeah. 
<laughs> All the while, um, he's breaking the fourth wall, which was cool in, in that scene as well, especially. No, it's a good scene. Yeah, no, I like that scene. I would say just, just about the cast as a as a whole. For me, this this wasn't one of those films where you watch it and you think, oh, there was like so and so like starring in a film. Yeah. Like I I wasn't taken out of the fact that it was our Andrew Garfield or Vanessa Hudgens. In fact, slightly, slightly terrible secret. I didn't re- I didn't realize it was Vanessa Hudgens until I looked out the, up the soundtrack part way through and right. was like, oh, okay. And then, and then I was like, oh crap, right. Okay, fair enough. So I never even recognized her until, until then. But I, I think the cast as a whole is pretty strong. I mean, Judith Light as well, playing Rosa Stevens. I've actually been, <laughs> I've actually been rewatching Ugly Betty right. recently, and she <laughs> plays a big character in that. And I was like, oh, that's her yeah. from that. So I was cool. just like, that was really cool to see her in something else. Honestly, you recognize the one from Ugly Betty, but not Vanessa Hudgens. It's so funny. <laughs> I know. <like> <laughs> 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 yes that's how my brain works apparently. <laughs> um but yeah no i i thought the the casting in this was really strong and there for me there wasn't any hugely weak links in terms of acting possibly would it be i just see i don't know how to pronounce his name robin de jesus as michael uh jonathan's friend i uh, a little bit not the strongest for me okay. probably one of the weaker ones but still not awful i actually agree with that because he's very different to how he is in the stage show oh is he actually in the show is he oh yeah michael and susan are in the show but like michael and susan are based on real people but they use the sh- the names from the show which i found interesting oh, okay yeah i quite liked him i didn't have any major issues with him his real name's matt like if they did mm. it based on reality he'd be called matt and Susan be called Janet. Yeah, there's a lot of scenes where I, I really liked Andrew Garfield's. Um, there's one where he's incredible during that number where he's just like found out that Michael has HIV. He's got, you know, he's positive with that. And there's some footage that I assume is not real footage of the pair at various ages. And I loved it because like Miranda mainly keeps it on Andrew while he's at the piano and he rarely cuts away and there's moments where like Andrew Garfield is letting his like ama- emotions like take over a little bit like affecting his voice while he's singing so it felt like very raw for me and more like effective than a perfectly sung song you know at this point in the film like the confidence from Miranda to just keep most of this scene just on Andrew Garfield is just really simple and probably the best way you could do it that was the scene where I was feeling the feels a little bit yes yeah feeling the feels I agree (laughs) just in terms of a set piece as well the piano in the rain is pretty pretty cool yeah in this like arena as well oh it's every emo girl's dream (laughs) 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 yeah (laughs) No, I agree. Andrew was really good. I didn't, you know, when he was cast in the role, was a bit like, really? <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't yeah. even know he could sing. Never mind. But he looked, he really embodied him, though. Like, you, mm. as you said, Calm, like, you didn't see him as Andrew Garfield. He was Jonathan Larson for that two hours. And I was like, bloody hell. <laughs> it's a good job. I mean, w- were there any moments where, you're like, this is too much? Like, he needs to, like, slow down or, or breathe a bit um, for you, Sam? Or, or was that just, like, a perfect portrayal of John Larson? I think it was quite. I think it was quite perfect because okay. if you watch the documentaries on him, he was quite a frantic guy. I feel yeah. like the artsy ones always are. <laughs> like, you know, I'm running out of time, all right. <laughs> okay. Like, yeah, he's quite a, an odd figure, we'll say. So I think he kind of got the energy right, which he would be insufferable to live with. Yeah. Like, all the time, can you imagine that? Just constantly, just this bouncy guy. So irritating. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite performance? Mine is definitely like Andrew Garfield for me easy yeah i'm gonna second that one andrew garfield definitely deserves that one yeah i think i would i would third that to be fair no argument from me and the academy agrees man he got a nomination yeah got robbed but got got a nomination yeah i think it definitely is deserved Uh, some people certainly said that will um, remain nameless because he's a naughty boy now but um he said Mm -hmm. that like you can definitely like see his soul through his eyes Uh, and i think you could definitely see that in in this it's just the range of emotions that he can portray Andrew Garfield is quite extraordinary. So acting score for me, I might go like quite high because Garfield and all of the cast are really, really good, to be honest. So I might go like a 9.3. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking nine, to be fair for us, Sam. Yeah, me yeah. too. Nine, but now I'm sad that we don't have points because now I can't be. <laughs> yeah, you can if you want. <laughs> the first time. No. We can't. We stick to our guns man yeah <laughs> yeah 
All right, let's add up the scores then for Tick, Tick, Boom. If it's not 30, dude, we have to like, redo it. Yeah. We are going to lower our scores. <laughs> Just start again. <laughs> tick, Tick, Boom gets 50.5. Which Ooh, is pretty means... good, pretty good. <laughs> good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like, oh. <laughs> oh. Ooh. I think when a film is in the 50s, I think it does, it's a pretty good score, I think. So. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I, to- I totally forgot what our other ones got. We- to be fair, we had Indiana Jones. That's going to score Hi. high every yeah. time. Yeah. That's it for part one. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Check out part two to see who wins. But don't stop there. Get involved and tell me what your favourite films are relating to the episode. Send us a DM or comment on Instagram and TikTok at Film vs. Film Podcast for X at FVF underscore podcast. Plus, we are now on YouTube, so hit that like button and comment there. If you do, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Remember, please leave us a five star review and subscribe. Pod signing off. (laughs) 